Brad, this had to have been a great adventure for you. Oh, man. I mean, once in a lifetime, right? It was just incredible. 12,525 miles. I actually spent some time in Charlotte for this. Did so, you? Um, yeah. And really. Wow. So, what was the adventure like for you? Uh, it was, uh, I mean, it was to be able to kind of live out your childhood through this exploration as an adult of, you know, I grew up watching wrestling yep. in Rhode Island in the eighties. And so I saw these guys as these cartoon characters. And, uh, now to be able to put a sort of a, a three dimensional human perspective on them to really understand who they are and what they, what they dealt with. And, and I, you know, part of the book was going back to their hometowns and seeing where they grew up and, um, trying to get a sense of who they were before they were the characters in the ring. And then to what extent they became those characters because they were expected and back in the seventies and eighties to live their character 24 seven. I've been blessed with the opportunity to, to interview a lot of these wrestlers. And I think one of the things that fascinates me the most is how down to earth they are. And, and, and then, you know, you talk about the character, you break down the character and stuff like that. And I just, I just love how passion driven they are to bring those storylines together. Yeah, the, and what's interesting is so several of the guys in this book. So I wrote about Sergeant Slaughter, yes, and, you know Santana, Hulk Hogan, the Iron Sheik, and several of them. When I would go and I would interview people that knew them, whether their family or their childhood friends, they said how shy they were. You watch his work, his interviews, and you know he's snarling with a gravelly voice, and you know, and I think once these guys got comfortable in that role, it almost became this this alter ego, this escape hatch for them to, to have a lot of fun with. When, when you got with the wrestlers and they were, they were starting to get more open with their, with the storylines, did they talk about the history of wrestling? Because I mean, to me, wrestling is like, is like martial arts. We could not earn our black belts unless we knew the history of Taekwondo. Yeah. And that's part of, so in the book, I, there's a whole chapter where I, I trace the history of pro wrestling. Where did it come from? Yes. And I, I didn't know that when I started my research, uh, that it really started out as this combination of collar and elbow style wrestling, which, uh, came over from Ireland in the 1800s and then catch wrestling from, uh, parts of the UK, you know, mixed in with a little bit of football, a little bit of Greco Roman <laughs> wrestling. Yep. And uh, and so initially, I mean, wrestling, what we well, or what we call pro wrestling didn't really exist until about the turn of the 20th century. Before then, you had matches that were like nine hours long. Oh. Right. So you can tell you can tell why they had to make it stage because no one wants to watch two guys sit on the ground for nine hours grabbing each other. Um, and so it uh yeah the history was important to tell i actually also went in the ring and did a day of training myself to know what it feels like to hit the ropes and to take a bump but i think the guys from my era that i wrote about had a maybe they they did have an appreciation because when they were brought into into the wrestling business when they would get trained back in the 70s the trainers wouldn't tell them it wasn't like they and very very gradually work like the last thing they would show them is how to throw a punch or a kick because that's you know not amateur style so they would first do a lot of the you know how to hit the hit the mat and, mm -hmm. and different more traditional wrestling moves dude I, I totally relate with that because in martial arts we were trained how to fall that was the main thing I, I, I came here to kick butt man no learn how to fall start landing on your back learn how to do it yeah the first thing I did when I did that day of training was take a learn how to take a fall uh yeah. over and over again and you know if you don't distribute your weight just right on that I mean the ring is itself is like a, a half an inch of um of foam of hard foam over uh plywood on a steel frame so there's a little there is spring it's not like a boxing mat but uh if you, you know when I did the when I took a, a bump and I if I didn't land exactly right i would get my bell rung and you can, you can see just how real that is dude i'll never forget when harley race came to billings montana and the ring didn't arrive and they put stuff down on that a uh, shrine auditorium floor and he still fought i just thought man that's a wrestler he's, he's gonna were walk you, away were you with... there were you there in person for that yes i was i mean that's back in the day when bret hart was a punk little kid man and the dynamite kid and everybody 
So you were out in the AW, like out in the in the West, in the AWA. Back yes, then. I was, and and Stu Hart was the one that brought it in from um, from uh, Canada. But then we we never got the Nick Botwinkles into Billings or anything like that because I, I I just felt like that Stu Hart had owned our part of the country. Yeah, man, that was uh, that, those are some great stories from back there, and um, you're right. The some sometimes the ring wouldn't show up, and so they would just <laughs> have a match on the mat, and, and probably do a lot of chain wrestling and a lot of mat wrestling, and. You know, someone like Harley Race, he was as fierce as they came when it came to <laughs> protecting the business. <laughs> now, when when you had a, that partnership with Iron Sheik and things went wrong, you write about it in the book. I mean, I mean, it, it's like, are, do, are you looking over your shoulder or is everything pretty cool now? Oh, he passed away. Yeah, um, but, but family, though. Oh, uh, well, I mean, so if you, you know, you can tell in the book, I mean, I... I know the family really well. Um, yes. Very, very close with his daughter and his his wife. And uh, I think when you read the book, yeah, the, that first chapter, the prologue is you know it's not exactly flattering, but you see the whole the whole arc of the story. And the book begins with that, but it ends with me going and seeing him again in 2022. Um, and you can see how much things have improved. So I think. Uh, Hopefully, the, the the happy ending uh, will uh, will you know make it all uh, fall together. The wrestling world is up the WWF. Well, I think Crockett and Mid Atlantic, Charlotte, you know, the, Greensboro, they all the, you you're underrated. You deserve more credit for having the first Starcade and that, Starcade, that closed circuit. That's it. Yep. Yep. You know, they did they did uh, closed circuit pay per view or not pay per view, but closed circuit uh, major event before. The WWF did, and so they're pioneers in that sense. I think that, but I think Vince McMahon, you know, the WWF did it in a in a way that had more impact um, in the mainstream and culture to culturally, because basically he was in New York City and Madison Square Garden. He got Muhammad Ali and Liberace mm. and all those celebrities, mm. and I don't think uh, Crockett didn't have that right. So. Crockett was always fighting that stigma of, oh, you're, you're just a, a, a local regional wrestling territory versus Vince McMahon, who was able to create this national reach. Did you get any, any opportunity to speak with uh, Terry Allen, Magnum TA? Because, I mean, I, I really honestly thought that when he was in that ring, we were falling witness to the next Ric Flair. And maybe he would have been Ric Flair or even a, Ho- a Hogan type yeah. in that, yeah, he had that that magnetism, that charisma, the look. Uh, I did not get to talk to him, but I did see they did a Dark Side of the Ring yes, show on did. him recently, yep. and and that tells the story of you know how you know, how tragic it because he was he was on the fast track for sure. Yeah. What is it about wrestling that connects people together? I mean, we could be sitting here talking to a 92-year-old man or a 12-year-old kid, and we would all be on the same page. I think it's that escapism. I think it's the storytelling. I think the things that that propel wrestling and make it popular are these universal um, uh, themes or constructs that appeal to, like, our human condition, right? The, The good versus evil the also the the exact or on your you know in wrestling that, that you could never say yourself in real life that's cathartic that's a chance to uh to lose yourself in in some in some character in some fantasy and so i think it's a it's a little bit of uh sort of fantasy escapism do you like the way that wrestling is growing in the way of being more reality tv driven i mean because over the weekend i watched a show where 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 stephanie it has, is, has teamed up with her husband and they're going with the wrestlers to get their memorabilia back from fans i'm going oh my god is it okay to take it back from fans i mean does it really belong to the wwe well well the hidden treasure show yeah i that's mean it, I, I think it. that I think that those things are cool because they're, I mean, they're usually like compensating the fans and they're usually saying, oh, this is going to go in our archive or it's going to go on display at, at WrestleMania's events. Um, so I don't have a problem with them. I mean, you know, making that effort. And I think by being part of that show, the fans get something out of it as well. So I, I kind of, I do, I do like that when, the promoters let people behind the curtain and, and kayfabe ended. It kind of um, felt more inclusive. It was sort of like everyone was in, in on it together versus 
some of the the more uh, adversarial, like oh, you know, this is you know trying to trying to fool people or say yeah. this is this is real, you know, competition. Yeah, I would love to <clears throat> do some research on how people are going to read this book. I think they're going to go chapter not one, two, three, but they're they're going to go throughout the book and pick out what they what they their points of interest, and then they're going to go back and reread the book. Well, I do hope that they read it from beginning to end at some point because it does. Although there are these discrete chapters where mm-hmm. I go, okay, here's the chapter on uh, on the Iron Sheik, or here's one on Sergeant Slaughter. There's an overarching narrative in the book, which is, you know, me on the road. You guys had experience working in Charlotte. I actually went, when I was in Charlotte, I went to the Park Center, which is where yes. Tony Atlas first trained, just so I could see the building and took some pictures of it. Um, and so i think when you when you read it all the way through you also see how interconnected these guys are so when i go to tony atlas he can share stories about the iron Sheik, and i actually ended up passing some messages back and forth because when i these guys often don't talk to each other that much anymore maybe they see each other at a convention so i took some video of one guy giving a little hello message and i would play it for the other guy and that was kind of cool to be able to be the messenger between them when you were at that park and doing your investigating, outside that building was the Bojangles Arena. That building holds so much history when it comes to professional wrestling. Did you step in there and at least feel the energy? Oh, man, I wish I had. I didn't. I did not do that. Um, but I, I have a lot of respect. I mean, I grew up in the Northeast, so I was a WWF kid. But yeah. I have a lot of respect for those North Carolina venues, uh, Charlotte and Greensboro. And uh, how just how special they are, how iconic for for the Jim Crockett fan, uh, promotion fans. Yeah, because we like it got to the point here in Charlotte where you know we we would uh, even though the Rock and Roll Express was so huge, we would cheer on the, the the other guys, the bad guys, and just just to rile up the fans to kind of piss them off a bit. Well, I think that the NWA, Charlotte, Mid Atlantic. The, you down there there was always a bit more of an edge like the the heels there was more appreciation for the the work rate of the wrestlers mm-hmm. and the matches were probably just better in ring matches than what you had in the WWF um and i think the fans there maybe they're, maybe they're kind of almost the precursors to the quote unquote smart fans of today that- turn this book into it's it's like a backstage pass you're giving it to us in a way to where we're, it's going to create conversation and, it, and when when they get their hands on it they're going to want to see you at one of these conventions are are you going to do that yeah, I'm actually in Philadelphia right now, so I'll nice. be at WrestleCon. So if anyone's going to be at WrestleMania for the, you know in Philly for the weekend, come by, say hi. I've also um, got a a new site called thebradpack.com where I collected all this wrestling history as part of my research, like internal WWF documents showing how much this pay per view made or how much this guy got paid. Uh, and so I because you can't put all that in the book, I'm gonna upload that to the site and so i hope people will check that out if they're really wrestling you know hardcore wrestling fans wow see so you've taken their business and made it into a business i like that i mean that's that's a continuation (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah well it's also uh it's 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 a it's a hard world out there in publishing these days so you know if there's any way to as a creator to uh to try to keep it going and I, i would love to tell more stories like this but Also got to pay the rent, right? Yeah. So I I like your line here when you say that it's a a subculture without a cultural home. I like that because it's like it's like it's there, but it's not there, but it's there. Right. And that is uh, in trying to define wrestling. It doesn't fit neatly into any category, which also I think is why wrestlers themselves are still not really properly protected when it comes to their their the, their profession the working conditions uh because they're not quite actors they're not quite athletes right and so there is no and i get into this in the book that there's no union they have no retirement they have no they're in they're classified as independent contractors which is insane because if you're working for the wwe they're not going to let you go work for aew nope. you know you're not you're not really an independent contractor uh, and yet that that persists to this day. So I and I think that despite all that's changed in wrestling, letting people behind the curtain, some some mainstream uh, society still doesn't take the, take them quite seriously enough to affect the the reform and the change that we need to better protect them. So 
the guys that are around now don't end up like some of the guys I wrote about in my book where they're, you know, Tony Atlas is 70 years old and he's still wrestling yeah. because he needs to financially. Wow. Wow. The, you know, one thing I did not understand as a kid is that because being up there in Montana, we got, we got to see what they were doing in Denver, which was you know, Nick Botwinkle. And then we had the, the Bret Hearts and we also had Bob Backlund. The thing is, I didn't understand as a kid, why weren't they fighting? So what we would do is that we would buy those darn wrestling magazines and we would create our own matches and then take each other on in our living rooms. <laughs> yeah, no, well, I mean, we all had our own ways of, um, acting it out right like it was it was the magazines it was the backyard wrestling it was my poor sister who <laughs> endured <laughs> me trying to put the figure four leg lock on yep. so many times <laughs> to the point where she would just like lay there being bored like are you are you done yet trying to you know <laughs> put on this fake move um so i think that yeah that we i think people now who are now in their 40s 50s generation x we grew up in the pre-internet days and and so this book is really a chance to to go back to yep. those days and 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 evoke that nostalgia did you write it as a fan or as a journalist well i think you're you're a liar if you when you do these projects if you say you either that you that you're not at all a fan you you are a you're a human right you're still a fan you can't you can't fully suppress that but i think i did as good a job as i could about being a journalist and taking that that seriously, that objectivity, uh, because I went and I asked guys some hard questions. You know, I asked Tito Santana about yes. his uh, the, the daughter he found out about recently, and um, that was well. I was trying to ask Sergeant Slaughter about his whether he served in Vietnam or not, and that was a whole storyline. Uh, so yeah, I, I was not not afraid to you know shy away. I didn't shy away from asking some some tough questions. Wow. You got to come back to this show anytime in the future. And next time you come to Charlotte, we got to get together and have a face to face, dude. Yeah, I'd love it. I, you know, I appreciate you having me on. And it's fun to talk to someone that knows wrestling as well as you do. Thank you so much. You'd be brilliant today, okay? All right. Take care.